Um, oops, let me turn this light on. Um, can everyone hear me? Um, thank you for joining us tonight. And our program is Spring into Planting with Wildlands Twin Cities. And it's um, uh, more than an infomercial for our plant sale. It's also the educational purpose of our plant sale um, and why we do um, the sale the way we do, um, what you can learn from it, what you can do with it, and how you can enjoy it. Um, and just a little bit about our plant sale. Um, first, our chapter has been around for over 20 years now. We were um, chartered in 2001. Um, we are now having our 16th annual plant sale. And while we've had our pickup in several locations, including um, Princeton, the last couple of years during the pandemic, we are uh, really happy to bring it back to Wood Lake Nature Center this year. So this will be our first time having it here, um, which is also our program home. Um, last year's sale got over 7,676 native plants in the ground um, into Habitat Gardens in the Twin Cities. And this is our primary fundraiser for the year. So this is, this is how we support all our free programs and tours and outreach events and educational materials. Um, but more than that, as I said, the plant sale is an educational resource. Um, I'm assuming you all know a little bit about native plants since you're uh, here with us tonight. But if you want to know more, we have all this information also on our website on the plant sale page. Um, but native plants to do things that um, cultivated um, plants can, cannot do. They belong here. They evolved here. They were here longer than the lawnmowers. Um, once they're established, they don't need the amount of watering or fertilizer. Actually, they don't need any fertilizer at all because they're adapted to the conditions here um, where, they, where they evolved. Um, an important note is to always make sure though that you match your species to, to your location because um, even within a, one yard, you'll have a lot of different micro conditions. Um, so it's always good to know what you're planting, where get the right plant in the right place. Um, if you are doing site preparation from the start, um, if you're starting with turf grass, you can dig it all out as I've tried to do, um, or you can follow um, this particular option where you can smother and cover and plant. Um, so there's some options there for you. Um, the big, okay, this is the, the, main, <laughs> the main part of, of our plant sales, our themed collections. Um, I like to say where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, we're not just selling native plants. We're not just advising people to plant native plants. We designed collections. Um, that have the right plants for the right place. So if you know you've got a sunny, dry spot, you can pick plants that are all ready to go. You have a, a ready-made garden um, for those conditions. If you know you want to plant something for the butterflies so that you have host plants and nectar plants, habitat value, we've got collections for that. But also for human needs. If you've got a boulevard, um, we've done rain gardens in the past and um, deer resistant in the past. Um, we, we try to always um, plan on what we want out of the garden as well. Um, and one last little note on placing and spacing. Um, each collection flat comes with eight species in six packs, so they're plugs, um, which makes them really nice and easy to plant. You don't have to disturb too much ground. Um, and these flats have been designed to cover about 50 square feet um, not necessarily a rectangle, however, however you design your garden. Um, but um, when you're planting them, make sure you take into account the mature size. Um, so at least give 12 to 18 inches apart, or one plant per square foot is a good rule of thumb. Um, short plants in the front or along the edges, tall plants in the back or in the middle, if you have an island garden. Um, and one more note, um, we pick our species all the way back in February. Um, we, we don't know that everything is going to come up. Sometimes there's crop failures. So when we design the flats, we always have pre-selected other species alternatives um, in case of crop failure. So you may not get exactly those eight species, but we, we try. 
Um, our first one is called Street Smarts, a hot and dry boulevard. Um, this is a perfect ready to go garden um, that has plants that are under three feet. They stay nice and short so they don't obstruct um, the view um, from the sidewalk or from the road. They're tough, they can handle the salt, they can handle the snow mounds from the winter, they can handle the foot traffic a little bit and the paw traffic. Um, they've got some that spread and reseed readily so that um, open spots will be filled and they're beautiful. We've got things planned so that you have a succession of blooms um, from the start of the growing season all the way into fall. And there's always ones you can add in and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, Andy Scott from Rewild has designed this year, this is our first time having this, um, uh, a garden plan for each of the flats. And this is his design for the street smart. So it gives you a sense of how you might want to actually plant this. If you have no, if you're new to native plant gardening and you're buying a flat and um, you have no idea where they should go, um, you can download and follow um, this planting scheme. And uh, it's, he's got six of every species and he even shows some great additions. Uh, here he added in spotted horseman, which is one that you can buy as well. Um, I just, I couldn't talk about native plants without showing some pretty pictures. Um, so these are, I've tried to pick some, some of my photos and some other photos that highlight some of the species that we're using um, this year. Um, things like prairie smoke, which are perennial favorites, but also um, prairie onion and blanket flower, which have beautiful blooms that um, last quite a while through the season. It's always fun too, to mix the colors. Um, there's just nothing prettier in my mind than uh, the orange butterfly weed with purple um, cone, or purple prairie clover. Um, there's also a succession of blooms. So you can see the, um, the harebell is getting going while the prairie smoke is already going to seed. So you've got the succession of blooms. Um, it's also a little plug for our plant signs. Um, if you don't know what your plants look like when they're tiny seedlings, um, it's a great way to do it. Pop in one of the plant signs. Next year when it starts coming up, you'll remember what it is. And it's especially good in boulevard gardens because people walking by will stop and read those signs. And we're educating the public on what these things are. These are not weeds, this is an intentional habitat garden. Here's an example of um, a boulevard garden with some of the same species and some different ones. This is Andy Scott's Boulevard and um, it's full, it's always changing, it's always evolving. Um, it's got the, um, the blanket flower right up front and um, we did a tour there last summer in the middle of the uh, drought and the heat wave and it still looked wonderful. Um, flat B is our butterfly hatchery. And um, this one's changed a little bit. Last year we did this as the hot and dry boulevard. So by doing um, a taller and mixed height and moist garden, we were able to do some different species. Um, yes, plant milkweed. Um, monarchs need milkweed, but plant more than milkweed because there are other butterflies and they need other host plants. And every plant in this collection is a host plant, including the grass. Um, and don't forget the nectar. Um, caterpillars nip, but butterflies sip. Um, it's important not just to have that host plant for the caterpillars, but to have that food for that attracts um, and keeps around the adult butterflies to give them their sustenance. I skipped a slide. There it goes. Okay. Um, the this is the garden design for the butterfly hatchery. Um, he did this as, as kind of an egg shaped design. Um, you can stretch it out, reshape it any way you want, but um, a good way of mixing those plants in and around. Um, here he's added the spotted Joe Pie weed as a, a really nice tall focal point that's also a butterfly favorite. I've had um, actually uh, my first sighting of Carter Blue in my yard was on my Joe Pie weed. Um, but of course, milkweed is 
popular with the monarchs. Um, in the short dry boulevard, when we did that for the butterfly hatchery, we used the butterfly weed, but we were able to do the swamp milkweed in this one because it likes it moister. Um, we've got the liatris, the metal blazing star for the adults, um, but also things like um, for the swallowtail, the uh, drawing a blank, the golden alexanders. Um, like I said, every single species is a butterfly host plant in this flat. Um, but when you, something amazing happens when you get the mass of flowers. Um, this is a picture taken just a, a, a little bit away from my house um, and what was just a mowed lawn uh, forever. It's under the Excel power lines in Bloomington and they reseeded part of this with native plants. And this was just like two years into the project and it, it was full of butterflies, not just this one monarch. Um, and it has a lot of the species that are in our flat plus a couple others like the Minarda. Um, but it just shows that it, it's, if you plant them, they will come. Um, but also to think about the changing season and it's not just butterflies that will come, the bumblebees will come, the moths will come um, and you get the changing colors in fall. Um, the little blue stem is especially spectacular. Um, the asters and the goldenrod um, keep the show going and keep the butterflies coming. Flat C is a burden bumblebee banquet. Um, we tried to, to do this one so it was attractive to uh, more than one kind of uh, critter that we wanna see in our gardens. Um, for birds, you need seeds and larval insects on your native plants. So all your host plants are giving you bird food basically. Um, and for bees, you need pollen, which gives them their protein and nectar, which gives them their sugar and energy. And every single species here has value to all those species, both birds and, and bumblebees. Um, here's Andy's design of how you might want to go around planting it. And he added um, six wild columbines around to add a little bit of uh, something for the hummingbirds, because they're birds too. Um, and there's a, a wide variety, not just of color and bloom time, but the shapes of the blooms are interesting in the, of themselves. You get a lot of variety that attracts different, um, di different species of bees um, as well. And this particular coneflower um, is actually the only one that is native to Minnesota, even though we all, a lot of us plant regular purple coneflower and um, pale purple coneflower, it's narrow leaf coneflower that is historically a Minnesota native. But they all work in gardens and they all attract birds and bees. Um, if you're going to plant one wildflower for birds, I recommend the wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa. Um, it, it's the photo on uh, well, your left um, was just a couple plants that filled in over a couple years, and it's just humming with bee. You, if you see, there's bees everywhere on almost every flower, um, and it's like that from the start of the bloom till the end of their bloom, which is several weeks. Um, but once they stop blooming, that's when the goldfinches come in. And this one's a little cloudier because I took it through a very dirty storm window and screen door, um, but it, it was uh, it was worth it just to get them eating the actual seed. And this one's at Coldwater Creek, but it just shows you that it's mimicking the, the, the more naturalized areas. You don't need this big of an area. Um, if you have a couple plants, um, like I do, the, um, the goldfinches will come. Um, our next one, flat D, is a brand new flat for us um, called Soft Landings, and it's based on a handout. I'll show in a little bit here, um, but it's all about having safe space for beneficial insects, um, which then feed the birds. Um, so it's a, a little bit of the same uh, theory that if you have the bird food, the birds will come, but this is protecting that bird food a little bit longer. Um, it depends on keystone species, which are your trees, your oaks, what's the rest of them, Leslie? The cherries, willows, popular, poplars, pines. Um, and what we plant underneath those matters for how um, protected all of that insect life is. That gives 
we're, we're giving them shelter at the base of the trees. This is one idea for a planting. This is with our bur oak, which is in our sale this year. Um, but how, how you might want to spread around those plants and mix them up and create a tapestry of planting for all those insects to safely fall and live out their life cycle. Um, here's the illustration from the handout um, that we have on our website. Um, and one illustration of it, I believe this is uh, Vicki Bonk's photo from the Naturescape with the zigzag goldenrod and uh, it's got big leaf aster in it. Um, but all of that is protecting that insect life. Um, here's a more expansive view. This is a Heather home garden, um, but you, it shows you that just um, expanse of sheltering plants at the base of all these trees. And I wanna point out, the, you can see the leaves too. So she leaves the leaves for the natural mulch and that also protects the, a lot of the insects that overwinter in the leaves and in the soil underneath. Um, you also get really interesting textures. Um, on the left, it's uh, wild geranium mixing in with some Pennsylvania sedge and interleaving with the foliage of um, early meadow rue, which is an underused plant, in my opinion. I think it's, it's really, really quite lovely, even though it's not um, as bright and showy as some of the others. And um, this is just one small soft landings I planted um, with a couple other sedges. And you can see there's not blooming yet, the zigzag goldenrod coming up. Um, but just, just a little bit gives everything under that tree enough, enough shelter. Um, but they're also beautiful species to add to any, any garden, especially a semi-shade or shade garden. Um, the bottle brush grass is striking. Um, there's the early meadow root, um, which are, are fantastic textures um, in, in their blooms, the asters that last for, for quite a long time. Um, and also pay attention to the little things that'll come to the blooms, uh, even the small blooms. Um, there's a surfeit fly, on wild geranium, an ant on the aster, and on the, the little beige blooms at the top of the stalks of um, the alum root, um, it has a really striking orange pollen. So you can always tell who's visited um, that plant and you'll see a lot of really tiny um, bees and wasps come to that. Um, we have a second shade collection, um, which works equally well as uh, soft landings, um, but it's designed um, specifically with pollinators in mind. Um, so we've got the wildflowers, but as with all of our flats, we like to add in a grass or a sedge for the texture. Um, and then when you're planting in shade, think about adding ferns and shrubs and understory trees to, to give even more texture and layering. Um, here's Andy's design. He adds a spike nard, which is also in our cell. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but you can really um, get striking patterns um, by how you plant some of these species, um, and especially with the su succession of blooms. Um, think about even in the shade from early spring to late fall, um, from the Virginia water leaf on the top, which is a really important spring bumblebee plant um, to the zigzag goldenrod. And then in between um, all the textures and all the colors mix. Um, there's, I think one of my favorites is the, the two leaf miter wart. Um, it, it, when you get a few of them planted on mass, they're, they're really lovely when they're um, all blooming and watch for the little tiny bees. Um, a, a new favorite is um, the wood mint um, and an old favorite is large leaf aster, which is fantastic around uh, trees and smothers creeping bellflower. Um, Here's an example from Leslie's yard of how green is also a color, or I should say colors. And you can see that rich tapestry of color and texture when you start adding in um, those other layers of, of ferns and shrubs um, to a shade garden. Um, it's by no means boring. 
Our last flat is one that we developed a couple years ago and it's been really popular. It's called Born to Mingle, uh, Living Mulch Ground Covers. Um, it's a new idea. Our program in May is going to be all about it on how to use plants and ground cover plants specifically um, instead of wood mulch to keep your moisture, to um, keep out weeds and uh, do, do a little bit more for your habitat garden, even with what's covering the ground in between your plants. Um, here's an example from uh, Leslie's garden again with prairie smoke and pussy toes and strawberry, um, just and, along with sedge, just all, all mingling together, covering the ground and blooming and looking beautiful. Um, Canada Mayflower, otherwise called um, False Lily of the Valley, is another stunning ground cover. It takes a little while to get going, and when it does, it's just super beautiful. Um, I wanted to point out the Pennsylvania sedge on the top right. Um, this is a photo from um, wildflowers.info, um, Minnesota wildflowers.info, but it, it really shows nicely how the Pennsylvania sedge will colonize. So if you plant it, um, space, give it good spacing because it will start to fill in itself and it will fill in around the plants in your gardens. Um, and then here's some wild strawberry that I planted in the sun and it moved itself into the shade and up a log and um, it, it's still going. Um, one thing about the plants in this collection, if you notice there was no planting scheme for this because this is the, the one collection that doesn't it is not a ready-made garden like the rest of the collections. This one has some for sun, some for shade, but some that will uh, tolerate both that you can mix and match all over your yard and use them wherever you need a ground cover. Um, two of my favorites are Pussy Toes and Common Blue Violet. And the bottom left photo is where they started to intermingle. Um, on their own, like we said, born to mingle. Um, and they're, they're, they're really lovely. They will spread through each other and not suffocate each other out. Um, but here's where some of the common blue violet just took, took over my lawn. Um, to me, this is a bee lawn. Um, I, I didn't really have much good grass to start and you can see a few little strands of it still trying to poke through. Um, I did have a lot of clover and creeping Charlie that were there when I moved in and you can see just a tiny bit of them left and the common blue violet has um, out competed them all and um, it, it's a much more lively yard. Plus I can talk my husband into not mowing it so early. And this one is just a reminder that even though we put particular species into our various flats um, that have their themes, um, they have other purposes too. Um, every single plant in our sale has wildlife value. Um, and if you look at the website, we've got all that listed on you with, uh, uh, not quite comprehensive, but we're working on that. Um, this is Pussy Toes, which is a host plant for the American lady butterfly. Um, and that's on my pussy toes there. Um, that's a Blue Commons photo of the actual butterfly. I didn't have a good one of her. Um, but I also wanted to point out, if you have pussy toes and you see this caterpillar in your yard, um, pay attention on the really hot and sunny days. And that's what they do um, on those hot sunny days. They pull up the leaves around and make a little, uh, use a little silk that they do and kind of close them in around them to shelter from the heat and the sun. And then they come out and they do all their eating at night when there's fewer predators. Um, in addition to our flats, we are selling um, additional garden favorites in threes because we want you to plant in threes. Um, number one, odd numbered clusters create more interesting and naturalistic plantings, um, but also you can spread them around and plant one in this garden, one in this garden, one in this garden, and have a little visual continuity between them if they're bigger plants like a joe pie weed. Um, and we have 24 different species that we're offering this year. Um, and we always try to change these around a little bit every year, but th these are some of our perennial favorites. Um, the first 
set of four are big and tall. So when you need that tall, stately structural element in your garden, these are some of the go-tos. There's some other species that we like as well, like cup plant and compass plant. Um, but it's, it's sometimes it's hard to plant a six pack of a big and tall plant. So that's why we've got them in the threes. And they vary greatly in color and in how they grow, but everyone has something to offer a garden um, and all of our garden visitors. Um, New England aster is one of my favorites, and this is why. Um, it's uh, all of the New England aster growing in my yard came from one six pack of plants about 12 years ago. Um, and that's why I love it. That's also why some people don't love it so much because it will reseed. Um, it reseeds in the lawn and it just gets mowed. Um, but it, it's a fantastic plant for filling in and creating a really big statement um, in fall when everything else is kind of looking a little tired and uh, things have gone to seed and you don't have that brightness as much. Um, and you can see the, the activity. This is just one day in September 2019. I just happened to be out with my iPhone and it, it's full of monarchs. And um, this was the big year of the painted ladies, um, but there were sulfurs in there and a ton of bumblebees and sweat bees. And um, I couldn't even count all the different species, um, but it was just like this from when the sun came up to the sun went down. Um, this plant was just full of activity. I and mean, it's also an interesting one because you can see a little bit on the right, there's some like baby pink flowers. Those, that's just a natural variation that come from, when you plant this, it will, it will give you a range of colors. Um, so it's one, one of my favorites. So I can't recommend it enough. And th three plants will last you a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next set of four are the unique blooms. These are some flowers that have um, really interesting and unusual blooms. Um, that keep us coming back to them. Um, the pearly everlasting, which almost looks like straw, um, but it, it's full of little tiny bees, little wasps, bigger wasps will come to it. Um, the bottle gentian, which only the bumblebee can pry open. Um, and one of my favorites for shade, Jack in the Pulpit. Um, we saw on a tour several years ago, they planted some of these on top of the um, Minneapolis City Hall roof, where it was literally in this much soil it planted and they got to be like this tall. I've never seen so, such big jack in the pulpit. So if they can grow there, they can grow in your yard. Another favorite is, um, oh, I'm trying to complete blank now. Rattlesnake master, thank you. <laughs> um, and I love watching this one. Um, when it's starting, it, it's kind of got a greenish cast to it. And it's a favorite perch uh, for my dragonflies. Um, but when it gets to the point where it's attracting the pollinators, it, it's usually full. Everyone's buzzing around it. And then when it's kind of done and going to seed, it, it's this really nice uh, golden brown cast to it and, and looks really striking with all of the grasses as they um, turn to their fall colors. And then of course it's also a good one for wasps, but we have a, a couple others that are specialties of wasps. Um, how many of you have uh, read Heather Holmes' new book on wasps? So I'm hoping you. I'm hoping the wasps are getting a little more love. So if you want to invite them to your yard, plant some of these of their favorite species. Um, my personal favorite is the great black wasp. Um, I stalk them. And, um, they love, especially the Virginia mountain mint up top right, but their real favorite um, is the spotted horse mint, um, Leonardo punctata. And I, I had my short lens on, I was literally like this far away from them on the plants and they couldn't care at all about me. Um, they, they were all interested in that um, plant. So it, it's an interesting one to show the neighbors that you don't need to be afraid of, of the social wasps or the, the solitary wasps. Um, a couple other plants. Um, 
The Culver's root is just a strikingly beautiful form um, when it gets going. And even when it's, when I thought it was past its prime, past its bloom um, and starting to look a little brown, it was still a hub of activity. There were mid-air collisions. That was one that I caught on camera um, where everyone is still buzzing around it for quite a long time. Um, and it grows great with all the purple cone flowers and all the moist loving plants. Um, it would do great with the butterfly host plant garden. Um, and then bone set is another one. And here's a thread-waisted wasp who can't even wait for the flower to open. Uh, the buds haven't even broken and uh, it, it's, it's waiting. Um, one of our favorite little collection of individual favorites to have this year are our hummingbird feeders. Um, you don't need to put a thing of sugary water out in your yard. You just need to plant some of these. Um, here is the um, cardinal flower. Um, this is in Andy's yard. Um, and this is in the middle of the heat and drought of last year's tour. And they still look that fantastic <laughs> and tall. I don't know how you must have like plutonium in his soil because they were, they were huge. Um, and these were just a couple of mine, of course, never I, where I could never get a good angle on the hummingbirds or get them in good light, but they, they came regularly um, to these. Um, the, they also love the turtle head, the white turtle head. Um, it, it, they couldn't wait for that one to open and they kept coming back to it even when the blossoms were turning brown. So there's still nectar. Um, for the uh, other lobelia, the great blue lobelia, here we've got a little thief. Um, this bumblebee is actually sipping nectar out of a hole at the base of the tubular flower, a uh, little cheater. Um, but also look for other critters to, to come to these flowers as well. Here's a little tiny bee um, collecting pollen from columbine. You never know what you'll see if you look close. And of course, if you start planting all the trees that we're telling you, you'll need shade plants. Um, I'm losing sun by the minute, and so these become more and more important. Um, woodland sunflower is one of the great ones to add to have some summer color in your shade garden. And it can get to be like this tall and will spread and create a little mass of, of beautiful yellow flowers right in the shade. Um, Solomon seal is a favorite. Um, I love waiting for the the blooms to open and the bumblebees to hang off the dainty drops. Um, and then I, I, a lot of people really like uh, red baneberry for the berries, which are very showy, um, but I think often overlooked are the really beautiful, delicate blossoms in the spring. And then spikenard, which is a huge favorite of mine. And I do mean huge, it gets to be a, a great big plant. Um, and it, it goes back to nothing in, in the winter. So it's, I always forget kind of where it was and what will, what will fill the spot. I keep thinking all winter, I need to get more plants for the spot. And then every spring, the spikenard comes up and fills even more space. I mean, it also gets really interesting berries that are always gone. Um, before fall hits. So the, the birds and the critters are, are cleaning those up. And it's always important to add grasses and sedges um, to your, your wildflower um, or wildlife garden and habitat garden. Um, we try to put at least one in every flat that we design. Um, and there's some others that you can um, always find room for if you have a little more space or if you want to highlight something special. Um, June grass is one of my favorites for that spring bloom. Um, it looks great mixing in with the harebell and all of the early and um, early er, late spring and early summer flowers. But then it turns this really interesting silvery white um, that looks spectacular um, mm -hmm. against the, the later summer colors and going into the fall. Um, and Fox Edge, which is a new one for me, but it's great recommendations to add to uh, habitat gardens. And if you've got room for big blue stem or Indian grass, they're, they're taller grass, taller prairie grasses um, that some people are afraid to use if they've got a small garden. Um, I, I think they're worth putting in in the background against fences. They, they will stay up during the snow um, and give you a little bit of screening until you cut them back in, in, the, uh, in late spring. 
Um, but also they make fantastic perches. That's another favorite for the dragonflies. Some of my best dragonfly um, pictures have been on, on big blue stem at all times of the season. Um, and also look, there, there's little tiny beetles and other bugs that, and, um, and moths that will come um, to, for the pollen on the grass. And our last collection of things are our native shrubs and trees with high wildlife value, which are calling nature's architecture. Um, it, it, planting wildflowers is great. Adding trees and shrubs is even better. You're exponentially growing the value of your yard to wildlife. Um, just one quick note. Um, consider the mature size, both the height and the width when you're planting. I always take into account the height, never the width, um, <laughs> but um, less, lessons learned. Um, and just like other plants, they have their requirements for, for soil type and sun or shade, um, but they have many, many benefits. Um, in addition to the, the structure, the woody structure in your garden, um, a lot of these have really spectacular spring or summer blooms, um, the redosier dogwood, um, the, the smooth rose, wild rose. Um, but my favorite is the dwarfish honeysuckle, which gets these lovely yellow blooms in the summer um, that the bumblebees can't get enough of. And a couple other bugs on it. Um, and then a favorite small tree, um, plant any service berry that you can, they're, they're spectacular. You truly get three seasons of interest. I think four too, because I think the bark is really pretty in winter, um, but you get spectacular blooms in the spring. Um, you get great fall color in fall, obviously. Um, but the, the biggest show is when the berries are ready in early summer. Um, and again, you will see the birds come. Um, I, I've seen cardinals and robins and uh, cedar waxwings um, and a few others that I haven't identified <laughs> all coming for the service berries and I hardly get any to eat myself. And then this year we were really, really, really happy to add a burr oak um, in a five gallon pot. Um, so if you're gonna plant one tree in your yard, if you got room for just one tree, plant a burr oak. Um, it's the best value for your dollar and for your yard. Um, I have a little quote from Douglas Tallamy, a yard without oaks is a yard meeting only a fraction of its life support potential. This is one of those keystone species to plant those soft landings underneath that will have the, a whole range of wildlife enjoying it and um, surviving, sustaining itself on it and sheltering under it. And then just a note to visit our website for details about all the plants um, that are in there. Um, we have um, not just the, the names of the plants, but if you click on the botanical name in Latin for each species, it'll take you to the minnesotawildflower.info's species page for that plant. And you can see how it grows in, in the wild and uh, how to identify it at different stages of its life. But we've also included on our, our webpage a um, little bit more information about um, the specific plants. So what their sun and soil conditions are, their bloom color and time, and their wildlife value. Um, and a little plug that if you'd like to volunteer, we, we still would love to have your help um, at our plant sale pickup on June 3rd. And with that, questions. Wow. We have a couple of questions that came in online. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and let me just ask the online participants, can you hear me right now? Can someone chat and we can just confirm? Sorry. <laughs> we had some trouble with this with the, okay. All right, yes. Okay, good. Everyone can hear us. Okay. Um, so one of the questions was, um, let me just scroll back so I can get the whole question. If I'm hoping to transition my grass lawn to native ground cover, do I need to kill the grass first or can I plant the native species and let them grow over, over time? 
Um, that's completely up to you. I, 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 uh, I have not had good luck killing grass, mostly because my grass is creeping Charlie. Um, but I've, I've found certain things overtake it, but um, if, if you want to be sure, <laughs> then um, yeah, I would probably either um, rent a, a sod cutter and pull it up or, or, or smother it for a season. Um, and any other uh, recommendations? Do we have some other recommendations from the crowd? I would suggest that you pull the grass very short you put down cardboard, you punch holes, and plant in the cardboard. Okay, so that, that smother technique that we've got um, on our on our website. Thanks. And then I'm wondering also if you could speak. I had a question about folks wanting to know more about edible medicinal plants. Are there any um, edible plants in this any of these collections? Um, I believe a couple of them are. Um, I know um, you can make tea from uh, wild bergamot. Um, I've never done that. Um, supposedly, um, I, I'm not really 100% on that one. That's not my area of expertise, but we do have a handout. Um, that we'll be linking to um, probably in a couple weeks that we'll have uh, have a full list of of the Minnesota species. Some of them may or may not be on this. Julia? The beans of Virginia water leaves are available. Okay. Virginia water leaf leaves. Okay. Yeah, sir, yeah, the, the fruit the fruits are easy. So the, the surface berries are are uh, and and the acorns from fur oak too. Um, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm just not sure on all the plants. I do have a note. So if you look at um, the website, if um, if I had it in our database that a species was edible, that would show up when I put that species um, information on the, the web page, which I just don't have in front of me. Holly, I just think that you would actually explain to our live audience that we were distracted this whole evening by this monster. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> There, there is a, in the window behind me, she's probably not there now, there's a, a Tom Turkey um, try, trying to attract a, an uninterested female who's grazing in the gardens behind us. So. Okay, I think we have another online question. I see we also have a question for the live audience. Let me get the online question first. Let's see. Someone has a question about Joe Pyweed. Um, I have a form of Joe Pie meat that basically tries to take over the park shade area of my yard. How can I keep it in check? <laughs> yeah, share. <laughs> dig, dig it up when it's small. Um, <laughs> rinse the roots so you don't spread jumping worms. Um, but uh, yeah, I just I, I just kept planting them until I ran out of room, and then I've given them away because both. Uh, both species of Joe Pie I have, we have one in our sale and there's another one too that does like shade um, that will reseed. And um, you can also though, just kind of cut it off before um, it goes to seed, kind of when it's um, done flowering and the pollinators are done and it's starting to dry up. Um, you can cut the seed head off and just compost it, but then you're taking that away from the birds. Okay, I think we've got a lot. Did you have a question? Oh, yeah. Are there any that have a longer blooming period than some others? And then Paul, can you repeat it just to make sure they... Yep, the question was, are there some that have a longer blooming period than others? Um, I, I've been surprised by a few. Harebell um, is one that it, it starts up in spring and it, sometimes it stops for a week or two and then goes again and then goes again and will keep blooming all the way you know, in, into frost. Um, I've been surprised by how long the um, blanket flower blooms last. It's like it, when, once it gets going and has a, a couple plants um, in a group, it, it's usually over well over a month, sometimes a little longer. Where there there'll be there'll be partic particular flowers at different stages, and usually some blooming and then some going to seed. Um, th those are two that um, go pretty well. The asters 
they start a little later, but then they generally have been very strong going all the way into fall. Um, New England aster starts a little late, but go, then goes the latest along with aromatic, which we don't have this year, but um, it, it, that's another good one for the, the late uh, season color. Mm -hmm. I would say early and relaxing is very interesting for a very long time. Yes, it, it changes, but it, it is interesting all the way through. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the rattlesnake master too. It keeps its shape, but the shape changes, um, but it's, all, it's always interesting um, throughout. Um, any other? Well, you also liked bergamot for that same reason. Yes, uh, especially once you got a few bergamot going, um, the uh, Minarda fistulosa, um, there'll, there'll be some at different stages of bloom and seed um, going all at the same time. Um, and that, that can last quite a while. Okay, we got another in live question. <laughs> well, this is kind of a question, and thank you. This was absolutely terrific. So I'm Julia, and I'm on the education committee. When we asked how long to do this, we said, you gotta do it for education, not a salesperson. Just a fantastic job. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Was that a rusty patch? Yes. <laughs> I saw a rusty patch on the hiss up and wanted to point it out in case somebody wants to go back and watch the recording to hear all of this again. But the third thing is, Holly mentioned how the goldfinch go to her monarda, but in my garden, they will consume all the seeds off the New England master. Mm. So that is another one that is really, really high value. Thank you, Holly. Thank you very much. And cone flowers too, the purple cone flowers, they, they love the <laughs> seeds on that. But thank you. Okay, let's see. Do we have any other questions online or live? It looks like we have a few more minutes. So folks, feel free to uh, ask questions. We have any in the audience? Oh, um, yep. Okay, here we go. Hi there. Um, I, I, my name is Barbara. I'm sorry. I just thought I'd unmute because I don't type very fast <laughs> to put it in the chat. But, um, you know, I just wondered, uh, I don't do many social media things, but I do pay attention to next door. And I noticed that so many people are asking each other about pollinators and flowers and that sort of thing, such as this. Is there a way we could post the um, a website or you know about the sale or something on next door um uh, so that some of those people might actually find out more about the wild ones that's a great idea um any anybody with a next door account um wild ones twin cities org is our website and uh -huh. then the sale page is just a, a link on there it's one of the sub pages um, and um, we have a YouTube channel too. So this recording and most of the recordings that we've been doing through um, uh, all the way through COVID uh, we've got on YouTube. So we can kind of repost those because there's a lot of great information on those. Um, but also on our website, uh, we've got a lot of resources and we're adding more. We, we're just finishing up some um, really a great series of info cards. Um, that are packed full of information on how to plant and what to plant for a sunny boulevard, a shady boulevard, a living mulch, um, soft landings, um, dry shade, uh, trees, and, trees and shrubs for, um, for a changing climate and vegetation for birds. So those could all be linked too. That would be a great way to um, kind of get the word out and get those resources into in front of people. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we got another question here. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, first, I want to bring a pitch for nine bucks, which is one of the shrubs yes. we have. And you didn't mention that one specifically, but it that is one of my favorite shrubs, particularly for the very early solitary seeds. So those who are like, like a life with the seeds, like me. <laughs> um, but my question is can you tell a little bit about? I assume these are first year plants. Um, so it will be a couple of years before we get any bloom from them. And then how big are the shrubs? They said they're number two and number five. And I don't really know how big the 
Um, yep, the the all the shrubs, uh, everything but the bur oak is in a number two, so it's a two gallon pot. So if you ever bought perennials that were in a, a one gallon pot, so it's just twice as big as that. So it's about about that big around and about that tall. And the shrubs will be different sizes. I don't think they're first year. Um, Prairie Restoration is our group. Prairie Restorations Inc. is our grower, and they grow all of their shrubs um, up north um, at, uh, in one of their um, spots, and they they vary by species. And honestly, I I won't know until they deliver them on, on Friday. To, I, I can't guarantee like how tall anything will be. Um, that baroque, um, they're doing that for us in a five gallon, so that's like a that's a bigger what big, bigger pot so two and a half times the size of the two gallon um and then the all of the the trios were were selling in threes those are all in four inch pots so those are the little square the square pots where it's one plant in each thing in each pot um and those are usually a little bit bigger than the ones that come in the six pack the six packs that are in the flats um those are plugs so those are uh, those are usually the first year plants in those. The, the four inch pots are usually at least one year. The shrubs are probably a couple years by the time they're potted for, for that size. Um, but so we've got a little bit of, of all the different sizes. Um, but the, the flats are, are great with the plugs because if, you, if you're trying to plant a large area, it would cost a fortune to use <laughs> bigger plants. and. Um, trying to dig up for like the gallon size um, to dig those big holes can can be a little tiring where um, you know those little those little tiny plugs are going to get to be those mature plants within two or three years. Just remember the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they truly, truly leap. Um, sometimes where you haven't planted them. <laughs> but that's the that's the fun of native gardening. Okay, I think we have some more questions online. I think you already answered one of them, Molly, which is where do your plants come from? So Prairie yep. Resto, um, which you guys can Google. And let's see, someone had a question, ideas for sandy soil on a slope in shaded. You have sandy soil. I do have sand. I don't have a slope though. My, okay. my yard's flat as a pancake, but um, the sandy soil, everything that's in the boulevard garden, um, the hot and dry boulevard loves sand and will do great. Um, and some of the others too um, that are in some of the other flats. So um, I've had good luck with um, the alum root does really well. Um, and um, uh, if you want another milkweed, world milkweed just takes off in the sand. Um, if you've got sand, try some wild lupin. I, I've gotten that to grow really well, and even some um, Carolina pecoon. I'm, I'm trying hoary pecoon this year, so we'll see how that works. <laughs> but um, there, there's a there's actually quite a quite a bit that likes sand, so you just have to. I'd stay away from the taller plants if you're trying to do a slope, just because it's really hard to go in and clear all that. So um, harebell will run right through it. And then we have another question, which is. Would the hot, dry boulevard flat work around a small trio of spruce trees? That I don't know. I don't have any spruce trees. I'm thinking not, um, at least not right under it where it would get shaded. Um, and then if the, as the tree gets bigger, it'll continue to shade, to shade out. And I, I, I don't have any experience under spruce trees, so I don't know if that changes the soil um, for this. And anyone with spruce trees <laughs> and recommendations? <laughs> Acid? Okay, so, yeah. I don't, I don't have that, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> okay, we got one more question online. Someone said, wait a minute, we were talking about sandy soil, what about clay? Ah, clay, yes, clay. Um, actually, my, my mother-in-law uh, has clay soil, and I actually put together a clay, a whole clay busters thing. She's in Cincinnati, so I got them from a local grower there doing natives. Um, so this I know. Um, swamp milkweed <laughs> um, will go through the clay. Um, I, uh, 
Um, yep, New England Aster. Yep. Um, cut leaf coneflower will go in that. That's a, and that one will kind of spread and break up the ground underneath too. Yep, Rudbeckia. Um, so black eyed Susan. Um, I'm pretty sure Joe Pie as well. Um, and then you'd probably, it would probably be good to add some of the grasses, um, like the Indian grass that will really send down those longer roots, um, as, as long as it likes it wetter. Generally, the things that like it a little wetter can handle the clay because it's holding, holding more moisture in the soil. And then I, I, someone asked about the source of the plants and you said prairie resto, but we will also have some a la carte plants at the sale. Is that right? So like- Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yes, we're going to try to have, um, in addition to the pre-ordered plants for pickup, we're going to try to have a small selection of additional plants. I'm still working on the list, but I think we're going to have a whole bunch of different uh, milkweeds. We should have common, showy, sullivans, world, as well as butterfly. Um, weed, um, and then um, a couple asters, a couple goldenrods. Um, I think I've got wild petunia on order. Um, we'll, we'll see if they actually have them for us, but um, there, there should be a, a selection. We'll have some in like the three and a half inch pots as individual plants, and then some where we're getting them in six packs and we'll be cutting that in half, so we'll be selling them with three sets of three plugs. Um, but as soon as I have confirmation on the species and sizes, I will add that to our website. Um, so keep checking back. Oh, I had one other question. Andy Scott rewilded his um, landscaping business. He had those lovely graphics. Mm -hmm. Are those also posted on the plant sale website? Not yet, because I just got them yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but they will be. Um, they, so those will be posted online, and uh, and so anybody who can can download those and uh, and plant from them, and or or even use those as guides to pick similar plants and um, for an idea of how to how to put together an instant garden. So Holly, uh, one more question for you. This is a lot of wildlife plants. So I have a lot of plants in my garden. There's these plants called bunny. <laughs> Um, um, so the question was, uh, what, what do we do about bunnies who like to eat all of the new, <laughs> the new young tender plants in our garden? Um, I have not had any luck at all protecting anything. I've tried chicken wire. I tried spraying the chili pepper stuff on and I was just seasoning the plants for the rabbits. <laughs> they, they actually seemed to like it more when I did that. So I gave that up. Um, I, I, I I've really tried to just overcome them by numbers myself. So I've just like planted a whole lot more. Um, but there are certain things that I did try to protect like Liatris, they can't resist Liatris. So if you can, you know, if you wanna like fence off a couple things like that, that you know they really like. Um, I've also tried planting some things. Um, whenever you see anything on our list, um, on our page and it says uh, deer resistant in its little uh, uh, description. Um, generally the bunnies don't like it as much either if it's hairy. So any anything um, that, that's got a lot of uh, hair on the stems, they tend to leave that alone a little bit more. Um, the mints, so Minarda is a mint uh, and the, the hairy wood mint is another good one. I, nobody's been eating on those. so maybe interspersing with a lot of those that are our lesser, lesser favorites. I've also tried just planting a bunch of gooseberries, which have a lot of really sharp thorns on it, but they just ate the gooseberries. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have any suggestions? And anybody else have better luck? Just the individual protections of the key species, uh, hardwood cloth, yeah. little, little fences on individual plants. So you can just dabble. Yeah, and and don't bother with chicken wire. They go right through that. So they, the bunnies will chew through chicken wire. So get the actual hard wire cloth that's um, 
it's a stronger thing they won't fight through. Uh, a long time nursery mom uh, taught me that they had used this in their nursery for many years. Um, one egg beaten into one gallon of water, sprinkled over the plant. So the sulfur from the egg yolk turns them off. The white of the egg uh, keeps, keeps it on the plant for about three weeks. Okay. You don't have to reapply it, even if it rains usually. And um, so for the very, very young plants, that might be something that you might try. It's rather than the beer you want. Okay, so that was one egg, full egg, or just the egg white? One egg. One, one egg to one, yeah. one gallon of water. You can sprinkle that on. So it, it's, you know, wetting the leaves and the bloom and, you know, the whole plant. Okay, just sprinkle and co cover, cover the new tasty plant. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, I think we're at 8.06 and our program is at 8. So I think we have to wrap it up. Okay. Um, do you have any final words, Holly? Um, I just want to thank everyone. Um, I want to thank our board and our education committee and our development and plant sale committee um, and everyone who's helped with this presentation and shared their photographs, um, including um, Minnesota Wildflowers, Vicki Bonk, Heather Holm, Leslie Pilgrim, and Andy Scott. Um, I'd like to thank Prairie Restorations, who's been a great grower for us and is uh, doing it again this year, um, and Wood Lake Nature Center, who is uh, we're ha having us host our plant sale for the first time here. Um, and just a huge thank you to everyone who has um, supported us through their volunteering, uh, through purchasing native plants. Um, through purchasing native signs um, and with your membership and just for joining us. And it's so nice to uh, be able to, to start to see people in person again. I, I, I for one, really appreciate <laughs> this opportunity. So thank you. Yes, pickup day is gonna not just be coming to pick up your plants. Um, we're, 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 we're going all out on this. So we're gonna, we're gonna have our, our plant signs. We're gonna have a membership table. We're gonna have an outreach table with all kinds of information, including um, those new in, info sheets that we've been working on. Um, we're gonna have some jumping worm education and some monarch habitat um, education. So uh, it's kind of a, a little, Open open house on Friday, June third, hmm? and oh, and tours. Yes, we're going to have two tours that I'll have uh, set up for Eventbrite registration because they'll be limited to fifteen people each. Um, but we're going to have a naturalist uh, do two guided tours on the property here at Wood Lake. Um, so for, join us Friday. June 3rd, even if you don't buy um, pre-order plants, co come and join us and be part of the party um, from between two in the afternoon and 7 p.m. And uh, again, th thank you for everyone who's helped and everyone who's helped kind of keep us going uh, through <laughs> through two, two long years of COVID. Um, we're, I think we're coming out stronger than we went in. That, that's all you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.